California. Yes. Out of all the universities, UC Davis has the longest running research program in the garden. Dr. Lisa tells Hummingbird Health and Conservation Program has used the garden for a study site since 2014, and I've been personally collaborating with them since 2015. Essentially, hummingbirds are captured and processed. All vitals are taken, including blood and feather samples for future D DNA analysis. Even the hummingbird's weight is taken, and if you ever wanted to know how a hummingbird gets weighed, here it is. And that's a male anise hummingbird. The last part of the process is to insert a tiny pit tag under the hummingbird's skin. A small incision is made to insert the tag, and then the bird is sutured up. Lastly, a numbered band is put on the bird's right leg, and this becomes a future visual indicator to me that the bird is participating in the study. Now the bird is ready to be released. Six antennas are strategically placed in the yard to track the tagged hummingbirds. The gray ring in this image is one of those antennas. Over the past six years, the program has banded or tagged over 1,000 hummingbirds in this garden. As the antennas collect data, this is what it looks like. The oldest known bird in the study is now six years old. It's a female Allen's hummingbird. UC Davis's groundbreaking work on the health and social relationships of urban hummingbirds has now been published in many peer-reviewed journals. So for my species documentation project, much of the identification involves photography. Uh, two years into my assignment, we realized that a compelling wildlife story was being captured with these images and the seed for the next Gottlieb Native Garden book was planted. That idea became a reality last summer with the release of the Gottlieb Native Garden, an intimate wildlife journey. The majority of the photos from this point forward are from this just published book. Now I thought before we get into the photos of the animals themselves, I would like to talk a little bit about some of the techniques I use to get them. I like to use flash in my photography. I personally like the look and feel of mixing different light sources when creating an image. On this afternoon, I was capturing female leaf cutter bees provisioning nests with pollen for their young. If you look closely to the, at the entrances to the tubes, you'll notice that they're different colors. Those hues represent the colors of the flowers or leaves that the female bees were using for capping their brood chambers. I spend a lot of time exploring at night. In this image, one of my trail cameras captured me as I checked camera settings while shooting nocturnal animals. Here's the bird I photographed that night, a common poor will hunting from a cement swale. Interesting fact about common poor wills, it's the only bird species in the world known to truly hibernate. I also have a few passive DSLR camera traps continually that I continually move around the garden. It takes a great deal of time and effort to set them up and to keep them operating. One of the problems is, is that wildlife loves to chew on the cables. But in the end, all the effort pays off with intimate shots like this one. These fawn siblings are no more than a day or two old. Camera traps have the ability to capture really candid moments. Oh, that's embarrassing. That's me getting caught by my equipment after dark. Um, but, uh, but out of all the photography featured in this book, the most technically complicated and time consuming are the focus stacked images made with live animals. This would be a typical setup a D850 controlled by an iPad with multiple flashes. Sometimes I shoot indoors so I can control the environment. Focus stacking is basically taking multiple photos of one subject at different focal points and then stitching them all together to form an ultra sharp image. It's an amazing process that has the ability to produce high detail images of very small subjects. And that can be proven with those aphids on the flower petals. Mm. With focus stacking, you are in complete control of sharpness and depth of field, enabling you to do things that just aren't possible with normal camera settings. So this happens to be an image of a Carolina Sphinx moth in front of the Gottlieb's entryway to their home. So I think it's a great place to start our photographic journey. As we're looking at these images, I'll ask you to keep in mind that every animal in this presentation is from one single yard. 
a yard right in the middle of Los Angeles. Some of these animals are reclusive and difficult to find, like this ring-necked snake. Others are so shy, we all have to be really lucky to ever see them, like this gray fox. But the majority of these animals, like this hermit thrush, can be found all over Los Angeles and California for that matter. All they need is the proper habitat and that's where native gardening comes in. Now I do want to point out one thing about this garden. The east side adjoins chaparral habitat, allowing a natural entryway for species of animals that need an expanse of native habitat, like California quail and this California thrasher. But the majority of the animals we get in the garden, like the cedar waxwing, can end up in virtually any of our yards. Many people think of European honeybees when they think of what they want their garden to support. But as the name implies, these bees are not native. They commandeer habitat, like this screech owl box, and now compete our native bees for pollen. When a honeybee swarm moves into the Gottlieb native garden, it's humanely relocated, like this hive that took over a barn owl box. When it comes to native bees, I believe we should be focusing on the benefits of native bees, like this ligated furrow bee, or this pollen-covered sleven cellophane bee, a personal favorite of mine. In Los Angeles County alone, we have over 500 species of native bees. I think it's over a thousand in California. These bees evolved with our native flora and have become expert niche pollinators. This diversity ultimately contributes to a healthy ecosystem. The garden has approximately 25 species of regular occurring bees. This digger bee is one of them. Digger bees can be really entertaining as you watch them zigzag from flower to flower and plant to plant. And occasionally you can actually see them cleaning pollen off of their tongue. Some of these bees I find extremely beautiful, like this female metallic green sweat bee. In the correct light, many species of sweat bees shimmer in metallic hues of greens, blues, and golds. There are many plant families that I consider excellent for insect pollinators and buckwheat, which is pictured here, is definitely one of them. Bees aren't the only pollinators working hard in a garden. Many fly species are good pollinators too, and some of them are not just good pollinators, but they benefit the garden in many other ways. Take this four spotted aphid fly, for instance. Their young are carnivorous. Females lay eggs near aphid infestations, and once they hatch, the larva eats large amounts of these tiny pests. After flies, beneficial pollinators would be butterflies, moths, beetles, wasps, and of course, hummingbirds. Although they're not the best pollinators in our gardens, hummingbirds don't stop pollinating when it rains, when it rains. Another group of insects we all enjoy having in our gardens is butterflies. As I'm sure many of you already know, monarch butterflies can be attracted to your garden by planting milkweed for the females to lay their eggs on, as it is the host for their larva. When planting milkweed, though, it's very important to plant only native varieties. For us here in Los Angeles, it's A. fascicularis or narrow-leafed narrow milkweed. Monarchs have a much better chance for a healthy reproduction cycle when using native milkweeds. And just as monarchs are attracted to milkweed, other species of butterflies are attracted to the garden by planting host plants for their larva. Quail bush is the host plant for Western pygmy blue, which is one of my favorites of butterflies found in the garden. Measuring in at a mere 3 8 7 inch, they are the smallest butterfly found in North America and one of the smallest in the world. Butterflies and moths are not just beautiful, but a very important part of the food chain. They lay an enormous amount of eggs, which turn into caterpillars, some of which can be huge, like this white line sphinx moth larva, who at the moment there is consuming a primrose flower bud. As the saying goes, if something's not eating your plants, then your garden is not part of the ecosystem. But not to worry, as most butterfly and moth larvae are small. Whatever the size, insect larvae are a very important food source to many animals in the garden, especially birds during breeding season. 11 species of birds have been documented nesting in the garden, and these would include uh, Buick's wrens, uh, which is the nest and parent is pictured here. Uh, the hungry mouths on the left are oak titmice chicks, and on the right are Nettles woodpeckers. 
I can't emphasize enough how many insects are fed to baby birds. The house wren on the left has a huge centipede and the woodpecker on the right has a mouthful of many different insects. That woodpecker would make probably 60 trips a day just like that, just to feed its kids. Most native plants produce food that our native animals are familiar with, like this toyon bush. When it comes to plants having the ability to support native wildlife, toyon is a keystone species. Not only do birds like this Western bluebird eat the berries, but the toyon's flowers are great for native pollinators. Clearly, this white banded crab spider is aware of this as she lies in wait for her next meal. Toyon is a perfect example of how wildlife prefers native over non-native. Toyon fruit will be stripped away from its branches by wildlife before ever touching the similar looking non-native pyracantha berries, even if those plants are found right next to each other. And this is true for seeding plants as well. Lesser goldfinches will eat native seeds, <clears throat> excuse me, before other non-native seeds. Historically, Anna's hummingbirds were the only year-round hummingbird species found in Los Angeles. They're connected with the rhythm of our native flowering plants. <coughs> Excuse me, the drink. They're connected with the rhythm of our native flowering plants. And manzanita blooms are a very important nectar source in late, excuse me, in late winter. And while we're on the subject of food sources, the garden has some bird feeders intended to augment the nourishment provided by the native plants. Nectar feeders are most abundant with dozens of hummingbirds feeding at them at any given time. This particular photo was taken in July and it shows three species of hummingbirds expected in the garden during that time. And that's Anna's hummingbirds, Alan's hummingbirds and black chinned hummingbirds. Every March, like clockwork, Orioles arrive and feeders designed especially for them will be filled and ready. This male hooded Oriole, and for those of you with, or, excuse me, this is a male hooded Oriole, and for those of you with Oriole feeders, you may be noticing that Orioles are coming more frequently at the moment than they have been. That's because they'll soon be leaving us to migrate south, and they're working on putting on their fat stores. A few seed feeders are available for granivorous birds like this California scrub jay. And mealworms are popular too, especially during breeding season. This male spotted towhee is about to bring a load back to the nest. Um, also, I don't know if you can see, but in the upper left-hand portion of this image is a cat. That's Sparky, one of Susan's cats in a cat run. These catatrails provide an ingenious way for cats to roam the garden. Wildlife is safe from the cats and the cats are protected from the wildlife. But I can't claim that the fish in the upper pond are safe from wildlife. When herons come in for a meal, they are not chased off and they're allowed to hunt without being harassed. When wildlife takes something from the yard, we simply consider it nature's tax. Along with food, wildlife needs a clean source of water. Here, a yellow rumped warbler drinks early morning dew that had collected on fairy duster leaves. Water features are an excellent addition to any landscape and the Gottlieb Native Garden has five of them. Not only do animals like these band-tailed pigeons drink from them, but animals bathe in them as well. The more diverse your water sources are, the more diverse the wildlife will be that uses them. Take hummingbirds, for instance. They love their baths as foraging for nectar is a sticky business, but they will normally only bathe in very shallow, continually moving water. No chemicals are ever used in any of the garden's water features and three of them now support thriving ecosystems. Over time, these water features have become an important stop for mig migrating birds. Birds have an excellent memory for resources along their migratory paths. And every year, hundreds of migratory birds visit the garden. During late April, it's not uncommon to see groups of Western tanagers jockeying for position in the lower water feature. Even a stormy afternoon didn't stop these cedar waxwings from using this water source, which is basically just a depression in a rock. So many of these images have stories attached to them, and I want to stop for a moment and tell you a story about this one. This photo was taken remotely by one of my DSLR camera traps. Here's what the camera setup looked like. 
The bath is in the lower middle part of the frame. The camera is in the middle left. I happened to be there in the garden checking on my equipment when a hailstorm began. So I retreated into the gardens, excuse me, I retreated into the Gottlieb's home to wait it out. About a half an hour later, I returned to find an amazing image, this rainbow. It was magnificent. The arch framed the garden for nearly five minutes. As I sat and admired it, I even noticed that hummingbirds would glow brilliant orange as they flew through the bands of color. It wasn't until the rainbow had fully dissipated that I checked my camera trap and I found this image. Just as the storm had ended, the afternoon sun broke through the clouds and a flock of cedar wax wings flew down to drink and bathe. The timing was remarkable and luckily my equipment functioned properly to capture the moment. And thankfully, everything performed properly for this moment as well. This is one of my favorite images captured during this project. And as you can see, it's more than birds that take advantage of water features. Another important component, component of a healthy ecosystem are predators, and they come in many shapes and sizes. We're familiar with spiders, like the graceful green lynx spider, and praying mantises, like this native bordered mantis. Some of you may have purchased mantis eggs from nurseries in the past, but I encourage that you don't do that because these are always non-native mantises. They're usually from Asia and they're much bigger than our native species. Ultimately, they wreak more havoc on our gardens than any organic pest control that they might provide. One native insect that you can introduce to your garden for organic pest control is green lacewing. During spring, many nurseries sell their eggs and once they hatch, these larvae will consume a large amount of plant damaging pests. Lacewing larvae are just only one of many small animals that make a living fiercely protecting our yards. Reptiles are a very important part of keeping an ecosystem in balance. Fence lizards should be recognizable to most of you. And many of you may have noticed that these lizards spend a good deal of time in bushes and up in trees. Being in the suborder iguana explains that behavior. Small snakes like this Western black-headed snake like to eat small terrestrial things like millipedes and centipedes. To give you an idea of how small this snake is, those are scrub oak leaves on the ground. Without close inspection, it might be mistaken for a large worm. Snakes come in plus sizes too. Our largest, the San Diego gopher snake, is an excellent rodent hunter. These snakes are confused with rattlesnakes all the time because they will mimic rattling with a combination of vibrating their tail and hissing. Unfortunately, it's the human that makes the miss of identification and it's usually tragic for the snake. After good long rainy periods, black-bellied sun, black slender salamanders appear. They spend the majority of their lives underground but will venture above ground to feed and breed when the environment is wet enough to keep their skin moist. Uh, this past winter, it was not wet enough and we did not see any of these salamanders. Many songbirds are excellent hunters, like western kingbirds, but even excellent hunters need to watch out for predators. No small, in the gar excuse me, no small bird in the garden is safe from cooper's hawks. I know that many of you may not be happy about having these predators in your yard, but they are a very important part of keeping an ecosystem in balance. Raptors range significantly in scope and size. Sharp shin hawks or sharpies are about the size of a robin. And this is the only bird in our area that I know that can capture a hummingbird in flight as I've witnessed it myself. On the other end of the raptor spectrum in Southern California, the apex predator on wings is the great horned owl. They hunt a wide range of prey and have the ability to carry a rabbit. And when you pack a set of talons like these, it's no wonder that everybody gets out of your way. When California ground squirrel populations grow large, we see a lot more of our favorite bobcat. He happens to be tagged and collared, and he's known to the National Park Service as B346. We call him Hank. Now I'm gonna back up this shot for a moment and show you something really interesting. Earlier in the day before this photo was taken, the camera got photos of two other mammals. That's Leo the cat taking Susan for a walk in the garden. 
was telling about this images that urban wild animals are so used to humans and domestic animals, they don't seem to care about sharing the same space with us. Now breeding season in the garden is always an exciting and lively time. Animals are defining and defending their territories. They are collecting nesting material, like this oak titmouse collecting cotton off of a cotton ball and building homes to raise their children. And by the way, if you've ever found a messy looking hanging nest that was constructed out of soft material and decorated with bits of leaves, sticks and flowers, that would be a bush tit nest. After all the preparation, the romance begins. And then the children appear, sometimes loads of them. However you feel about California ground squirrels, their babies are really cute. A magical time to tune into the garden is the period between day and night. It's that space where the diurnal animals are just finishing their shift and nocturnal animals are beginning theirs. And once it's dark, I highly recommend exploring your garden to see what you can find. Yes, there will be the usual suspects like orb spiders, and moths, all of which I find extremely beautiful. I mean, the wings of moths are literally nature's canvas for elaborate tapestries. To me, the pattern on this elder moth could be used as an elegant dress. But if you simply take the time to be quiet and observe, you're sure to be amazed at what appears. Take beetles, for instance. Some species are active during the day, like this green fruit beetle, but many more are active at night. They come in amazing designs and colors and their life cycles are fascinating. The beetle on the upper left is a firefly. And yes, we have fireflies in Los Angeles, but it's the flightless females that glow and not the flighted males. But out of all the beetles I encounter in the garden, black bearing beetles are by far the most interesting and fantastic. They're always covered in helpful symbiotic mites, and I could do a presentation on just their life cycle alone. And let's give a shout out to striped skunks for a moment. When you notice that holes were dug in your garden the night before, you really should be saying thank you. Skunks have an excellent sense of smell and front claws built for digging. They snuffle around your garden, searching for root damaging grubs and dig them up to eat preventing damage to your garden's plants and trees. Apparently this guy was coming from the next door neighbor's yard where their sprinklers were on. And it seems that he got his face muddy while collecting dinner. Oh, and by the way, for those of you that don't like scorpions to a skunk, they're considered a delicacy. And here's a tip for those of you that do like scorpions. The easiest way to find them at night is by searching with an ultraviolet light. Their exoskeletons glow a bluish color by absorbing the longer wavelengths in the UV spectrum, then re-emitting them in different wavelengths that are visible to us in the dark. Northern raccoons are just one of the many different characters utilizing our gardens at night. And sometimes when these animals paths cross, there's drama. And I know this appears bad for the skunk, but there's no need to worry. In the end, it was the coyote that got the raw end of this encounter. I know because this was only one in a series of shots. And don't you just love the look on that skunk's face? He's just about to leave a lasting impression on that coyote. It's always exciting when you run across a really unique animal like this unusually patterned striped skunk. Like the leucistic hummingbird I showed you, it makes him very easy to identify. And I know from trail cameras that he visits the yard frequently and has been around for over three years now. There are two great horned owls that have been around even longer. I began working in the garden over six years ago, and they've been a bonded pair that entire time. I know it's the same birds because their routine has stayed exactly the same year after year. The larger female is on the left, the male is on the right. Great horns breeding season begins in November and many will have eggs in their nest by January. They don't actually build their nest, they commandeer somebody else's like a red-tailed hawk or a common raven nest. You may be hearing great horns right, frequently right now as they're still keeping track of their young 
from this breeding season. Another animal romance in the garden is between our male bobcat, Hank, and a young female who showed up about this time two years ago. I wonder if she liked his park service bling. In this clip, she's marking a stump in the garden. Her scent will let Hank know that she's in heat and will accept his loving advances. But whether you're prowling around on your own or wandering around with others, you must always stay alert and on guard. As there are constant dangers threatening all wildlife, even animals as large as a deer. Yes, a mountain lion has even visited the garden. P-22 isn't the only lion roaming the Santa Monica Mountains east of the 405 freeway here in Los Angeles. Huel, as we've officially named him, is an uncollared male with unknown origins. Over the past four years, our cameras have captured him a few times, the first being on October of 2016. What I find incredible about this cat is that he manages to stay virtually undetected to the residents of these neighborhoods where he roams. I mean, a, a real testament on how these big cats want nothing to do with human contact. All inspiring encounters with mountain lions aside, our gardens are alive with special moments every day. I encourage you to take the time to sit quietly and observe. Special moments are sure to reveal themselves. Like an adult Cooper's hawk drying its feathers after a morning shower. Or a flock of cedar wax wings moving north in spring. Soon, we'll know that fall is upon us with the arrival of white crowned sparrows as they fill the air with their delight, delightful melodies. With patience, you might witness a minor dispute over water rights at a favorite bath. The more you tune into the rhythms of your garden, the more wildlife will appear. That's the connection. That's how connection happens. And that's the Zen of it. And who knows, one day you might be sitting quietly and realize that somebody's watching you. Thank you, uh, sorry. Um, for more information about the faunas and uh, about the garden's fauna and its history, you can find that in Susan Gottlieb's wonderful book, The Gottlieb Native Garden, A California Love Story. Um, my book, the one we just looked at, is The Gottlieb Native Garden, An Intimate Wildlife Journey. And if you're interested at all in seeing what's going on in the garden animal-wise monthly, I have a blog on their, on their website, which is thegottliebnativegarden.com. And with that, I think I will send it back to you guys. All right, great. Thank you, Wonderful. Todd. Does anyone have questions? And I am happy to answer any questions you guys have. I really enjoyed that. Oh, I did too. Good. Is the garden open to tours or visits? Yeah, it is. So prior to COVID, uh, there was a couple of very large garden tours and, that would uh, that were held throughout the year and occasionally private uh, garden groups were allowed to come. Um, during COVID, there was basically nobody there, but now they're reopening it up and, and basically any, if it's a, you know, any group of five, six or more people can contact them and have a tour of the garden. They're, they're being really gracious about letting people see it right now. That's awesome. And it is a private garden. It's not a public garden. So how many acres was it again, Scott? It's just over an acre. Uh, you know, when you're there, it seems like it's much larger because of this terraced hillside. Um, but it's really not that huge of a space. But it's because of it backing up to that natural chaparral. Mm -hmm. I assume it's a green belt. Well, so again, um, as I, uh, I said in the beginning, this is geographically right in the middle of Los Angeles. And the Santa Monica Mountains run through Los Angeles. And where this house is, it's essentially... Um, uh, it's above sunset in Beverly Hills. This is a, it's not, it's not a wild area. This is, this is all residential, but there happens to be a wildlife corridor that runs 
behind the property, a very thin corridor, which is essentially a space in between properties at the bottom of a canyon and properties at the top of a canyon, maybe a couple of hundred yards. And then, and that goes on for about a mile and a half, two miles. We do get animals in the garden because of that. And it does support, you know, some animals that need that chaparral um, to survive. So, I mean, the only reason, well, I shouldn't say the only reason why that mountain lion ended up there is because of that, uh, of that of that wildlife corridor because it is showing up in some very urban neighborhoods but it is helpful and again for birds like california quail which for us here in los angeles we never find them more than a block away from chaparral um it's it we get those species because of it yeah you described the garden before it became before it was turned into a native garden so basically yeah the um to give you a little bit more history on the garden um the Gottliebs, which is Susan and Dan, uh, husband and wife, um, I think starting 40 years ago, um, one of their favorite things to do was explore California. And that was just driving around, exploring, taking pictures, taking back roads. They, um, really, they really love to go to out of the way places. And they really love the desert as well. One thing they noticed was is that uh, Mono Lake um, was having a lot of trouble because of the water use in Los Angeles, because here we get so much of the water from Mono Lake. And that's a very important stopover for migratory birds, especially when they're traveling north, they feed on the brine flies. Well, without much water there, there wasn't much habitat for the birds. And that's where Susan's sort of idea started. You know what? I'm going to do my little part in Los Angeles to save water. And she wanted to create a water conservation garden. So what was lavishly planted with water hungry plants and grass and everything else, she ripped it out and created a Mediterranean garden. Um, but what she noticed in doing that was that that garden, although it saved a lot of wildlife, I mean, excuse me, it, I mean, it, it saved a lot of water, it attracted no wildlife. There was really nothing being attracted. By chance, a couple of natives got put in with that early uh, landscaping scheme. One of them was uh, evening primrose and white line sphinx moths use that plant for uh, laying eggs on for their larvae. And she saw that happen and immediately she realized, oh my God, the, the animals aren't coming because they don't know what to do with the plants. And that started her journey on planting native plants. And again, this goes back like 30, more than 30 years ago. She, so she was just doing this, you know, she, there was not much literature back then on it. She kind of figured it out on her own. What, what type of plants are your favorites for, for being pollinators? <coughs> Excuse me. Um, probably buckwheats by far. The buckwheats are just great for so many different pollinators. But then we have a lot of bee species that are, I'm not going to say they're plant species specific, but there's definitely certain plants that they really go after. Um, right now, bladder pod, well, bladder pod um, blooms a, a good portion of the year from spring through summer. And we have some extremely tiny carpenter bees that love the bladder pod. Um, uh, then there's, uh, there's uh, let me think of some others. Uh, the, well, the toyon is still in bloom right now. And there's a lot of sweat bees using the toyon. But I would say if there was one that I would recommend, it would be any buckwheat. Are, are they um, real particular about, I mean, are, are the, uh, are you or whoever's planting and replacing plants, are they real particular about the type, the, uh, the actual, say, buckwheat that comes from that area? Or is it all just, it can be California no matter where, or how particular are you? That's a great question. First, um, I have uh, very little input on the plants that go in the garden. My my role there is to see which plants are attracting wildlife and what wildlife it is, right? But when the garden, when Susan started shifting to planting native California plants, yes, that was a huge range. In fact, that was all the way down through Baja, California. Over the years, um, she's really beginning to narrow it to Southern California and, and even trying to narrow it further to our general area of uh, Los Angeles County. There are a lot of plants that are in the garden that will not come out that are from maybe Northern California or Baja California. But, um, you know, plants will die and things change. And when, whenever a new plant's put in the garden now, she's trying to be as local as possible. 
And in a way, it makes sense too, because if it's planted in the right uh, sort of habitat niche that it was growing in around here, it's going to do very well. So it, it benefits the garden doing that, as well as the wildlife. But what I've noticed about wildlife is, is that it, the, a lot of it, well, I shouldn't say, some species are very, some species of pollinators are very species specific, but the majority of them are more family specific. So if it happens to be, you know, a particular buckwheat that's found in Northern California, it's going to get used exactly the same down here. And um, did you have uh, any issues with the pine suskins uh, this year like we did up here? No, you guys had that problem. I don't think any of that, uh, any of that uh, disease made it down here. Um, we, so we do get pine siskins here, but generally they're from our local mountains. They're not from as far north as, as I think you guys get them. I believe it was just south of San Francisco or maybe to Santa Barbara where they had confirmed cases of that salmonella. Um, but we had no confirmed cases here. Of course, a lot of people thought that maybe they saw, you know, something, but there weren't confirmed cases. Uh, but there was, people were worried. But, but during that period, we just didn't have pine siskins. So we knew it wasn't here. No, the cedar wax wings, we have them here and then they move on. Are, are the ones that we have here, ones that have moved on from Southern California or is it a whole different population do you think? So what I know about cedar wax wings are is they're nomadic. So they, when they're not breeding, they form their large flocks and they roam. And, and I think they could roam from very, very large areas. Some could be from here to there and from you guys down to here, but others could be from other states without any problem or even Canada because they, 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 they roam in these flocks looking for food. When they find food, they seem to hang out with it. Um, and when they exhaust that food, they move on. They're like bandits. I mean, and here in Los Angeles, they'll, they'll as these flocks roam around, they, they just like mow down the toyon berry bushes and other berry bushes here. You can see where they've been. And, but you can't say when they'll be here. You can't say if they're gonna stay all winter. You can't, you can't, you don't know. They're just nomadic. Okay. Scott, what do you have in your hummy, herm, excuse me, hummingbird feeders? What's the mix that you have in there? One part sugar to four parts boiling water. Just regular old sugar. Yes, because what that's doing is it's replicating the sucrose uh, to water ratio in the flowers that hummingbirds enjoy. And what white sugar basically is, it's just sucrose. You shouldn't use brown sugar. You shouldn't use raw sugar because the, all the molasses is going to do is promote the growth of pathogens in, in the water and they don't need it. All they're looking for is the sucrose. And, you know, one of the reasons why this garden has so many hummingbirds and, you know, literally at any given moment, it has 100 hummingbirds feeding there all day long. That's for two reasons. One, um, Susan's been feeding hummingbirds for a very long time and hummingbirds from very far have realized that food is there and they'll come and they'll feed from it. She's always kept her feeders clean, which so she's never interrupted that cycle. But last, the garden is producing a ton of food for them. Um, well beyond the nectar, it's producing insects because uh, hummingbirds are insectivores. And one really cool thing about the water feature she has in this garden is there's a lot of midge fly larva in it. So there's lots of there's lots of flies in the um, or there's lots of food in the way of midge flies for hummingbirds, so it's it's a it's a it's a bounty for hummingbirds. It goes far beyond just those feeders. Uh, I can barely hear you. Mike Owen had a question about long tail weevil and how are your routes. Um, so we don't have any weasels in, in this, in this particular part of Los Angeles, there are just no weasels there. There's just no habitat for them. Rattlesnakes. We've only got a rattlesnake in the garden two times. And the reason for that is, is because it is so, so landlocked, I guess you could say, or so, you know, there's not much wild area around 
that over time when when rattlesnakes end up in someone's yard those people always kill them i mean there's very few people who don't kill them and over the years they've just eradicated all the, the rattlesnakes from around and in fact um, in my first four years in this garden, I never saw a rattlesnake, and I had anticipated that I would never see one, um, but now we have seen two. They're not really a problem. So, Scott, how do you keep the water from not getting all this algae? I have a circulating pump here at home, a, a water feature. The Hummers love it, but I just it just starts getting this green algae so algae does yeah so all these water features they're just recirculating is what they're doing um they have autofills on them and you know when the water gets too low so they're automatically filling so they're always staying at a good height of you know, of uh, good height and flow but they do get algae in them and they do require cleaning sometime but it's just basically they're manually cleaned. I mean, it's never really gets out of control with al algae, um, but there's a lot of stuff like that's living in there that's eating the al algae. Um, there's been a couple of times where it actually grew on the top of the water, it'd have to be taken out. But one thing that does happen in all of these features is, is that um, leaves and things collect in them. And that's a really laborious uh, project to take that stuff out without interrupting you know, the larva of different insects and, you know, damselflies and dragonflies and things like that that are in there. Um, so I guess this is a long answer to your question that it's manually cleaned out, but uh, never totally cleaned and, and never any kind of chemicals added to it. It's kind of, it's weird, you know, like I can, I can, you know, uh, some people will ask, you know, well, what do you, what does the garden do about pests? And, you know, what do they do when there's an outbreak of pests in the garden? So, like I said, I've been there a little over six years now, something like that. Um, I have never, while I've been there, seen one animal overrun the garden. It's never happened. There may begin to be an explosion of some insect and then another insect, or another animal, you know, goes after it. It's really weird. Wildlife gravitates to the easiest source of food. And because all the different niches are exploited in that garden, anytime there's a lot of food, whoever eats that particular thing hones in on it and eats it. And I'll say that that's a little bit true about the water features because these ecosystems have been allowed to develop and become more and more diverse. The algae problem every year seems less and less and less. So I have a question about the native milkweed. I, I understand the argument against planting the colorful hybrids, but I've also heard an argument against planting the native if you're not in there, the natural corridor that the monarch would be traversing. So I have been reading a lot about as you move north through California and how there's different viewpoints on how you should deal with milkweed, especially if you live by the coast. Where we are here, so I can't, but I can't really answer that because I, I know more about what's happening here. Here in Los Angeles, we can have monarch butterflies year round. Um, we do get um, a sort of a push in the winter that winter here, you know, so they'll come from the north more along California, um, maybe a little bit of, of Nevada, I think, um, comes down here and winters along the coast. But that's a separate population than a group of monarchs that never leave here. The, pro what the problem we have is, is, is that when people have the non-native milkweed in their garden, so that would be the Mexican milkweed the one with the beautiful orange flowers and the, and the wide leaves, um, that stays nice and healthy year round. And, it sh and the monarchs should not be breeding here in the winter time. If they do, the, almost every time that brood's gonna die. There's, it's gonna get too cold, something's gonna happen, diseases can attack them or pathogens can attack them easier and and it just sets up for there being a breeding problem. That's why 
it shouldn't be grown here. Now, what a lot of people do, um, and what I'll tell people is like, oh, well, I love the, the you know, that non-native milkweed. Okay, fine. When you get to November, cut it back and cut it back just like a rose. Just cut it right down to the roots and it, it'll come back. Throughout the winter, my two or three times, you might have to cut it again. And then by the time you get to February, you can let it grow again. And then that way, well, two things happen. Uh, and again, I'm talking about for the Los Angeles area. Um, one is, is, is that you removed the milkweed from the monarchs to not allow them to lay eggs on it when they shouldn't be laying their eggs. The second is, is there are pathogens that can collect on the leaves. And because these leaves never shed themselves, if they're left all winter, the pathog pathogens are just left on the, on the leaves for the caterpillars to come and eat them and ingest them and then become sick. If you cut the plant down, then you've taken away those pathogens from the, mon from the monarch larva. Um, and the reason why you have to do that is because our native narrow leaf milkweed, it goes dormant in the late fall and winter and basically all the leaves fall off. So again, I know there's, there's a lot of talk now about, well, there shouldn't be any milkweed planted at all where they winter, shouldn't be planted along the coast of central and you know California. Again, that's just stuff I've read, but I don't know for sure because I'm down here in Southern California. I ask a question? Sure. So I'm not um, expert in, or knowledgeable about these things like most of the people on, on the, um, the workshop, but I'm really fascinated that it's only one acre. I, I mean, yeah. I envision this to be, you know, several acres at least. And so just, uh, so would you say that if you expanded it to two acres that you'd still have the same balance and intensity, or is this just a, an intense uh, ecosystem because it's only one acre. I mean, do, is, is this the way it naturally would evolve or is it more concentrated because it's only one acre? That's a, that's a brilliant question. I'll say this, is, is that although this garden is, you know, a, a, about 90% native, right? So the, the flora is about 90% native there. It's not native flora all native flora to that particular spot in this particular area of Los Angeles. It's, it's much more rich. So I'm going to guess that if you were to, to look at the biodiversity, the overall biodiversity in this garden is probably more than if you went to the Chaparral, well, I'm, I know it would be more than if you went to the Chaparral area, that's not too far away. Um, or if you went to Oak uh, Woodland, that's not too far away. So I think the biodiversity would change, but probably what wouldn't change is the amount of animals that are there or, you know, the mass of animals. I think that the garden is supporting exactly what the neighboring areas are supporting in mass, but not in diversity. I think the garden itself has more diversity. And I'll, I'll give you a great example of that is, is that um, I'm doing the bat study there. And the way the reason why I know what bats are there is because I record them and I, I record their their calls. Their calls are, are quite specific or species specific and depending on what calls they are. We have 10 vetted species, meaning that not only did I vet them, but I gave those calls to a biologist, uh, the sonograms, to a biologist and they vetted it. Um, 10 species and we have three more that are in the vetting process. That's a possible of 13 bat species that are using this one space. And what uh, a, a more than one bat, bat, bat biologist has said is, is this is quite remarkable. Mm -hmm. and, and this is why it's happening, is, is because the garden is producing a lot of food for these bats, which for around Southern California, it's beetles and moths. Mm -hmm. So a lot of beetles and moths are flying up above the garden. And because bats are long lived one, and two, they, they'll fly a long ways to a food source. One of our common bats is Mexican free tail bat, and I think they'll fly like 20, 25 miles to a food source. Over time, they figured out, well, this is a great stop. You know, I'll stop here at the garden, see what's happening there, see if I can get some food, and then move on. So the, the, the garden has created this intense food or feeding stop for a lot of bats. And... Out of those bats, what a very interesting thing that has happened is, is that there's a particular bat called Yuma myotis who can be found in the garden every single night. It doesn't, it's just, uh, it's there every night. Well, I shouldn't say it as an individual, it as a species. 
Yuma myotis are closely associated with water. They're closely associated with our LA River here. They're, they're, they're closely uh, associated with any of our reservoirs. They're just a bat that's around water, probably because they're eating insects that that water produces. It's like their niche that they take advantage of, right? Well, if that's the case, why are there human myotis above this garden every single night? They shouldn't be here. I mean, maybe, you know, having a stray every once in a while is one thing, but having it return night after night after night after night when it should be closely associated with water, that's very interesting. And I think that's a good indication that this garden is doing something different than if it was just the native habitat that was close by. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You know, when I think of one acre, I think in the, the where most of us here on this uh, Zoom call are live in is probably six houses per acre. Uh huh. And, and many of it, maybe seven. Many of us have some futility because our next door neighbor has no diversity happening in their yards. So it's amazing to me that in our small little urban, suburban, actually suburban settings, that we have as much activity as we're able to generate. And that none of us, not having an acre, should ever feel like we can't create this tremendous amount of diversity in a garden space. That is exactly 100% correct. And the Susan Gottlieb, her mission is, if you can plant a native plant in a pot on your balcony, do it. You know, if you have a very small yard and you plant a couple of native plants, that's fantastic. She is not about re-landscape your whole house right now, find these big spaces, so on and so forth. She's all about one plant is great. And basically what that does is it creates a patchwork or islands around a particular area where these animals can, you know, go between. And it, it's amazing. You literally could put a milkweed plant out on a balcony and attract a monarch butterfly to that milkweed plant. So yes, you don't need an acre. You don't need an acre at all. Um, you know, not, not everyone is as fortunate as Susan to have both that size yard and the resources to do what she did, but that's not what everyone has to do. It, it, it's just doing the little that you can. Has she inspired her neighbors or any of them converted their acre lots? To... Another good question. Uh, I would basically no. Um, so this is an area that, you know, very manicured yards, very, you know, you know, all have a theme, tropical this or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And although these neighbors uh, do stop and talk and admire, and um, once a year that the house is open to, uh, it's a huge tour that goes on that'll attract over 500 people to this garden. That's when all the neighbors will come over. Even though they all like it, I they're not doing it around that neighborhood. And one of our biggest things right now is is that there's a lot of i don't know if this is going on where you guys are but it certainly is here in los angeles and especially in this neighborhood and and neighbors like it around la um smaller houses are being torn down and then larger houses are being spec built and any landscape could go in and what one thing about this garden is it, the gottlieb native garden is it's it's literally it's beautiful it, it shows that california native plants can be really gorgeous and she's just hell bent right now to try to get these landscape designers to start incorporating some natives into their plans. But even to this point, she's, you know, uh, she's, she's getting, uh, she's kind of getting nowhere with it for, for whatever reason. And I think a lot of people think they, they think of California native plants, they go straight to cactus, which, you know, that may have been true 30 years ago when people were doing their native landscapes, but the, the palette of plants today is so diverse. But yeah, unfortunately, there, there are no immediate houses that have done what she's done. Now, I will say a caveat to that, though. That garden has influenced hundreds of gardens throughout L.A., but, yeah. but, just, but not in her immediate neighborhood. 
is in your book, are you, um, do you include a, a map sort of orienting where this garden is in relation to the town? Or are you trying to keep it? No, I don't. And no, it's not a big secret, but you, you can, uh, if you just go to the website, I, uh, you can see where the, where the garden is. Okay. Yeah. I mean, if, if you're familiar with Los Angeles at all, it's, it's kind of nearish the four or five freeway in sunset. And to, sorry, go ahead. If you can hear me, I had a question about how are the plants sourced? Uh, do they buy them from native nurseries or is someone growing them on the site? There is a plant association called uh, the Theater Payne Native Plant Society here in Los Angeles. And that's where 90% uh, of the plants come from. And they're, they're doing a great job. They've been around for a really long time, but um, there seems to be a groundswell here in Los Angeles of, of native gardens. And the Theater Payne Foundation is, has been on the forefront of that. And they're really into educating people of, you know, how big this plant will get, where it should be planted, what it'll attract, you know, what you need to take care of it. So they're, they're a fantastic resource if you're in this part of California. Wait, Wait, I'm sorry, repeat that again. You mentioned that you stitched together oh. images. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. And that those were just separate photos in the, from different cameras, or they were all shot with the same camera, or how that works? So um, it's called photo stacking. And essentially what you do, uh, well, if, if any of you have take photos at all, you know, you know that you're dealing with something called depth of field. I mean, we as humans are dealing with depth of field all the time. You know, whatever we're looking at, whatever is in, uh, you know, near us and farther away from us, uh, from that point we're looking at is out of focus. And that's true when it comes to photography as well. And when you're taking photographs, uh, macro photographs, especially of small insects, that depth of field becomes so narrow that you could be you could focus on a bee's eye and just behind that eye on the antenna is completely out of focus well the only way you can deal with that is by taking multiple photos and what you basically do you could imagine if you had a bee i would uh, start focusing uh, on the front of the bees let's say nose and continue to focus back through its head and its body taking multiple or taking shots each time I move the focal point. For an insect, it might be 100 shots. And so it's the same camera, um, but you're focusing from one end of the subject to the other. Now, the biggest problem with that is, is, is that if something doesn't move, that's very doable. But animals tend to move. And it's, it's, it's hard to get a set of images that you can that that the animal didn't move once you have that set of images uh, there's software that through some crazy algorithms will stitch all the sharpest points of each of those images that you just took or in other words all the points of that of each individual image that's in focus stitches them all together and does a pretty good job um, at, but it's not perfect after it's done that, then you need to go in yourself in that software and tell it basically, yes, you did a great job here, here, and here, but this is what you should be putting there, and so on. It's extremely laborious. Once that's done, for any of you who've had fun in Photoshop, you bring that into Photoshop, and then you finally finish it where you fix areas that the software couldn't do itself. But um, to give you an idea of how long that can take, we had a, an exhibit at a uh, at a gallery here in Los Angeles of, of, of these photo stacked images of insects um, that we did portrait style. And one, one of those images from beginning to end could take me 10 to 12 hours to, to complete. But the, you know, when, when you have a complete image where it all comes together, it's mind blowing because you could blow this up the size of a building 
and every last aspect is in focus. It's just dead, dead on in focus. So it, it's a really cool, it's a, it's a real, real cool process. And the last thing about it is <clears throat> whenever you're looking at one of these images, you don't know why, but something, something I'm saying bothers you is the wrong word, but your mind is very curious about the image. And the reason why your mind's curious about the image is everything's in focus. And your mind knows that everything's not always in focus. Your mind is always, you know, dealing with, you know, depth of field constantly. Well, now you're looking at an image that everything's in focus. And what a lot of people will say is they look like they're three-dimensional. But it's just your mind trying to deal with the fact that this doesn't look right and I'm not sure why. But ultimately, it just creates a really, really interesting image. It's just very time consuming. And Scott, I have a I have, question. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Julie. There are a few questions that have come up on the uh, the chat. And there was one about uh, asking if the water use at the Gothic Garden shows that they're using a lot less water than their neighbor's landscape. And then the other question was, has the drought started to result in changing attitudes? On so I don't have access to their water bills, but I'm going to say that I'm sure they're using nothing compared to their neighbors around there. I know as fact they are, but so let's just say the answer to that is yes, they have much lower water bills than their neighbors. The second part of that question. So there's a lot of discussion going on, especially now as this we're now leading into and this looks like another drought period how to deal with watering the garden and uh, essentially the only thing that really gets watered continually are new plantings and that's so that they're not you know they don't die especially in these hot periods um but now that we're in a second year of drought again or we went just through a whole season of no water um there's a you know there's one part that says well we need to put water in the garden and and i'm really fighting 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 saying no don't put water in the garden these plants deal with it they lived with it they've evolved with it um but there are some issues one of the issues is um i don't know if you guys have noticed this up there on oak trees but there's something that's starting to infect oaks down here um i think it's called uh western oak canker or something like that and and basically when uh, uh, oak, I forget, Western oak beetle, I think might be the name of it. Uh, when they tunnel underneath the bark of the oak trees, lay their eggs, and then their larvae create these chambers, there's a particular fungus that, that gets in there. Because these trees are stressed from the drought, um, that fungus is, has, is taking over a couple of these trees. So those trees now are getting a lot of water. So yes, they will give water where it's needed in the garden but as the years have gone on they're dialing back more and more and more water and i think basically the idea what's going to happen next or, or later in the year is is that if we're not getting any rain they're going to begin watering the garden as if we're getting a lot of rain and they're going to continue that all the way into next year but then as soon as we hit you know may again then stop the water again so I have a garden that I've worked in for about 25 years and the garden is really defined by this amazing, glorious, big, huge, old, old native coast live oak. And twice in the time that I have professionally taken care of this garden, the client and I have spoken to each other and we've recreated spring rains because we've been concerned that we would lose the tree if we didn't supplement the water. Yeah, that's the, the, the oak trees that are on this property. Um, all of them have been planted, um, but but many of them were planted. Well, I should say they were all planted because what were that was there before was removed um, when the neighborhood you know was put in. Um, they removed all the the walnut and all the oaks and all the chaparral, just just mowed it all down and put in non-native planting. So. The oaks that are now on the property, they were planted some of them over 25 years ago, so they're quite large. Um, but they are getting attention with the water for sure. Now, because of you know the, the last drought period we went through, they got nothing special, but they were smaller and they seemed to do okay. 
but for some reason right now they're really stressed and they're they are getting a little bit of water right now they're getting some good soaking um there's an arborist that works with a garden who wants that to stop but but we're just worried about this particular canker that is attacking two of the oaks right now and i i think once we get past this season then yeah like you just described um regardless of the rain those oaks are going to get soaked during the winter and then no water again during uh the the summer period it's weird you know the water situation like that is a challenge because there are some plants um in the garden that their rain period because of where they came from in california would be longer than some other plants that are near them where the rain period would be shorter and less rain um so so watering is always an issue do, have you had any barn owls? We, uh, our, uh, our garden club installed a barn owl box, what was it, a couple years ago? And we've yet to get any activity, though it's in a, a habitat area that it, it, they should come to, and the company that installed it is optimistic. Is it, a, is it plastic or wood? No, it's wood. Good. So, uh, yes, we get barn owls in uh, the garden. <clears throat> no, uh, barn owl has not uh, nested in the barn owl box that's in the garden. Um, with that said, uh, one of my projects here in Los Angeles is barn owl boxes. Um, we have Wild Wings Ecology, and we literally have put out hundreds of barn owl boxes in LA County. And what I can say is, is, is that, uh, and I say this to everyone when I install it, you know, I'm not a wildlife god. I don't know for sure if this is the perfect spot. You know, I'm trying to get in the head of an owl. I'm trying to get into their, the way that they behave, you know, um, and what, what they like to choose for their roosts and nesting spots. But there's never a guarantee. And, but the only thing I can say is, is that the longer that secondary uh, cavity nester, nesting, nesting boxes are out in a you know, essentially a barn owl is a secondary cavity nester because it has no ability to create its own nesting hole. Um, the longer it's out, it's, it almost ferments like wine. It just gets more and more part of the environment. And then, you know, one day it gets discovered. And for barn owl boxes, it's the same with passerine boxes. After that initial discovery, it's almost like everybody wants it. And it becomes really popular. But it's that waiting period of that happening that can be so agonizing. And, and you just have to wait. It's, I mean, that's what nature is. It's a practice of just breathing and Zen because you know you wanna be able to control it, but you can't. But as long as someone installed that in an area where historically there are barn owl boxes and that it's installed in such a way that it's attractive to a barn owl, then eventually it's gonna get inhabited. It's just, you don't know when. It will have to be patient. Yes, it you know, and and God, wildlife is so crazy. Um, during this this past season, normally we go through a big push of putting in barn owl boxes. Um, at a point where barn owls are already nesting, but you know, people, it's on their mind. Oh, spring is coming up. I'm going to put up my barn owl box. Well, you're too late, but that's fine. You know, we can put it up. Um, so normally any barn owl box, any barn owl boxes we put up uh, late winter, early spring, and they're never going to get inhabited um, until the following season. This year, something crazy happened where um, we put some barn owl boxes on a ranch in Malibu and the owner put some ring cameras in them that day so he could look inside the boxes. Four days later, one of those boxes had a barn owl fly in and check it out complete, just walked around, basically measuring it, looking, you know, where the furniture goes. It was unbelievable that it was so fast that that happened. So it's nature. You just, you never know, but uh, it, it's usually you have to wait longer than you want to wait. And this actually for us down here, this past year was a really good breeding year for barn owls. So was the year before. Um, the year before they actually double clutched. Um, this year they didn't. I have a feeling that we don't get any rain come late winter, we're, then there's not going to be a good breeding year uh, next year. But these past two years were great years down here. Julie, I think Karen's got a question about Orioles. Yes. Uh, 
can you read it? Just oh, is it the one, the one for Oriole feeders? So an Oriole feeder is basically um, a hummingbird feeder, but the ports are larger. So uh, humming, I mean, an Oriole can fit its beak into those ports because a hummingbird's beak is obviously a lot smaller than, a, than an Oriole's beak. Uh, the second thing is, is that hummingbirds have a tongue that stick out uh, as long as their beak. So if you're looking at their beak, their tongue comes out again that far. So they can reach very, very far down into feeders. Orioles can't do that. Orioles have to put their whole beak in to get to the solution. So the hole has to be large enough for their beak to enter in and then they can touch the solution. The problem is, is that now the hole is large enough to allow bees and wasps in. Um, over the years, we've discovered two types of Oriole feeders that are pretty good about keeping bees and wasps out. Um, as for the food that goes in, in them, it's for here in Los Angeles, it's the same as the hummingbird solution, four parts water to one part sugar. If you're, but, but Orioles will accept a less sweet solution. I think it can be all the way to like one part sugar to, to six parts water. But we don't do that here because if your neighbor is feeding hummingbirds and the Orioles can get their beak into that hummingbird feeder, because what a lot of people do is they just remove one port from the hummingbird feeder then the oil is going to go to the sweeter solution. So we just always say down here, just the oils will come less often, but put it in the same sweetness as for the hummingbirds. Hi, I have a question. I was wondering uh, how many people work on regularly maintaining the garden? There are, th there's three, uh, gentlemen that are in the garden about six days a week. And then there are occasions when there's five and they have to clear for fire. That's one thing about where we're at is that the fire department's really intense about fire clearance. And so during those months, um, they're doing a lot of very careful pruning and clearing so that they conform to the fire regulations. But over the years, um, Susan has actually offered her services to neighbors around there to adjoining properties because what people normally do is just they basically, you know, nuke whatever is there. They just rip out all the plants. They do it with weed whackers. They, they shovel everything out. They destroy everything. And you're taking away natives that could stay there as well as killing wildlife. So uh, the, she has a large crew during that time um, to do the neighbor's yards where they do it all by hand make sure they're not killing any wildlife, making sure they're only taking out what they need to take out. Um, but then like now uh, the period of the, of the garden is, is three people who are there and they have enough work. There's always enough work to do. In fact, um, you know, it's always a battle with me because if it was up to me, I would have them do no work. I'd rather the garden just let it go completely wild. Um, but it, you know, the, the struggle between me and them keeps the wildlife surviving and happy and it keeps the garden looking nice. <laughs> and and uh, Susan, one thing that people do ask is, is Susan Gottlieb involved anymore with the garden? She's 100% involved in, you know, where things go, what things get taken out, um, big picture plans, all of that. She's very, very involved in the garden. It's, it's very much her garden. All right. Well, thank you for having me, and thanks for really. You guys had great questions. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. It was great. All right. Thank All right. you. All right. Well, take care, everybody. Bye bye. Stay cool. <laughs> oh, yeah, we'll do our best. <laughs> Thank right. you. Night, everybody. Night. Night. Bye.